fluid building up in there. His, uh, mm-hmm. his legs are just all burnt out. Mm-hmm. Grinding all the time. Hope he don't lose his legs. All right. I was up at 3.30 this morning. And right now, I'm very tired, and I'm not complaining. I enjoy what I'm doing right here and right now. And is that on? (laughs) I'll need to hook this to my body. And last night, now why was I up till 3.30? Last night... I was working on this, and this is our Constitution, and the church needs a Constitution. And right here, if you'll look, you will see it is the Constitution of Bible Doctrine Church of the City of Anderson, the County of Anderson, of the State of South Carolina, of these United States of America. And this is the Constitution. Now, it's not all completed yet. I think I got through Article... I got through Article uh, 6. Through Article 6. And if you want to read this, and see, this is Baraka's, by the way. This is Baraka's Constitution. See how old it is? It's got a little rust stain right there. That's how old Baraka's Constitution is. Well, we're following uh, Baraka in the Constitution, but there's been a few changes because there's been some uh, uh, doctrinal ad- advances that the colonel made. And since this is so old, well, there's been a few changes in this. And if you want to look at the Constitution, and it's not, um, put it on that table back there, and it's not, Uh, completed yet, but it will be completed in the future. And uh, and then we have this, and this is the uh, Baraka Constitution, and this is what I'm working off of. And then we made some changes because this was made, I don't know when, but you can see the rust marks. I mean, it was made a long time ago. And... uh, since it was made such a long time ago, there's been some uh, things that the colonel has uh, come up with that have uh, made some of these things void in the Constitution. Uh, but we will have a Constitution. And as part of uh, the Constitution, why are y'all pointing? I don't understand what. Are you irritated by this? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, okay. So the uh, so I just showed you the Constitution, and uh, I was looking over that, and I was looking over that until about uh, 3 a.m. this morning, and uh, that's not an excuse. I'm going to keep going. So we have here now. I uh, now my wife. What my wife did for Christmas was she. Uh, got me the Limbaugh letter, which goes out to every month, and she got that for me for Christmas. And so that's a gift that keeps on giving all year round. And I'm going to read an article that he wrote, and it's uh, quite interesting, and in fact it's something that tells us about America and the uniqueness of America and the fact that you live in a free country. So I'll begin here and read what uh, he wrote. (coughs) So this article is called American Exceptionalism. And I'll show you the uh, front of the article just so you'll know. And it's uh, this guy looking like uh, he is a founder of the Constitution and all that. So I'll begin (coughs) reading from this. On February 14th, a car bomb killed Rafik al-Hariri, and he was 60 years old. And he was the five-time prime minister of Lebanon 
who resigned four months, uh, who resigned four months ago amid tensions with Syria. Immediately, newspaper editorials called uh, for international mediation to deal with the crisis. Now, this was the New York Times. They said, we need international mediation to deal with the crisis. Yet every time the United States of America tries to do something uh, great, as in the invasion of Iraq, the New York Times says, well, that's an awful thing. Well, how else are we going to do something great unless it's with the United States military? And that's how these United States have done something great. Now, we're a soft nation. We're soft because we are hyper sensitive and people are hypersensitive about the things that uh, for example if you say something about the word of god well they won't show up the next day because they are hypersensitive they're arrogant and that's a problem in these united states and if that does not change we will go under as a client nation to go to god and that's not uh, anybody's fault except those who reject Bible doctrine. And if you reject the Word of God, you are the reason why this country is going under. So I'll continue with this article. So, no, there's only one power. This is what the article says, and this is what Rush Limbaugh writes. No, there's only one power in the world with the capacity to pull the plug on car bombing terrorists and it isn't the news media, and what he's saying is the news media is always critical, but they never uh, have the power to stop the things that are going on. They just criticize, and that's what people do. They criticize, and, and, and um, well, I'll continue with the article. So, and, and then he goes on to say, and it is no accident, American power, the direct consequence of the profound wisdom woven in the warp and weave of our founding documents, dominates the world stage as has no nation in history. The nature of that power is unlike any other, and that is true. We are a client nation, and we have a power that is greater than any other that has existed since the time of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire encompassed just about the whole world. But we, the United States of America, do you know that you live in the United States of America? You have a privilege as living under freedom in these United States. And as living under freedom, you have the possibility to learn the Word of God. And if you're not here today to learn the Word of God, then maybe you shouldn't be here. But I think that uh, as I uh, look around and as I take some uh, simple observations for myself, it seems uh, quite obvious to me that there are a lot of people who care nothing for the Word of God. And that will mean our downfall as a client nation. And that's a sad thing. And that is a terrible thing. And it makes me sad. But if we were to get with the Word of God as a nation, and if we were to grow in grace and in knowledge, we would survive as a client nation. But it seems to me that people just don't care. And that's a sad thing, isn't it? It's terrible. People just don't care about the Word of God. And you say, well, I care about it. I don't understand why people don't get it. I don't understand it either. But they just don't get it. They don't get the fact that there is a positive volition for us to grow in grace and in knowledge, and I don't get it. I don't know why people don't want to listen to this. I don't know why people don't want to listen to grace. I don't know why people don't want to listen to the colonel. I've never got it. But they don't, and it's sad. And the Apostle Paul actually cried about it. He wept. And when he wept, he uh, wept with great tears. And he said, many of those I know are enemies of the cross. And there are people I know who are enemies of the cross. And they're enemies because they don't care about the word of God. They don't care about what it says. 
Now, they're arrogant. They're very arrogant, and we'll get in this. And today, I'm going to give you a reason to have a break. Because <laughs> I'm going to be up here for a long time. You're going to have a reason to have a break today. So, let me continue with this article. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Let me continue with this article, and uh, if y'all will help me pick that up, I'll just continue with the article. So, the uh, article continues. From the beginnings, Americans knew. As the nation was born in revolution, our founders, and now it wasn't revolution. That's not the way it went. This was a, uh, a fight for freedom. Revolution is not, uh, uh, well, in the Bible, if you are uh, revolutionary, that is not the way the Bible wants you to be. But this was a fight for independence. Our nation came from a fight of independence. It did not come from revolution. Now, the French Revolution, they were mobs. There were a lot of mobs in the French Revolution, and uh, they changed their government through mob action. But these United States is unique because we are a client nation to God. Right now, we're a client nation to God. But it's sad that people don't want to learn the Word of God. But you're here, and I'm glad you're here, and we're going to learn the Word of God. And in fact, uh, in April, the first week in April, I'm going to be here. Now, it's supposed to go on vacation, but I decided to be here. And why am I going to be here? Because that week I don't have to work. And that week when I don't have to work, I'm going to be able to study these things and give it to you. So we're going to have, in that first week of April, and if you show up, that's wonderful, but we're going to have in that uh, first week of April at 6.30, 6.30 Monday through Saturday, actually, Monday through Saturday, the first week of April, we're going to have a message at 6.30, and then we're going to have a message uh, following that. And then uh, on Saturday, we're going to have Saturday night at the movies, and what's going to happen is I'm going to... Uh, well, we might bring a TV in here and put it up front up here. I don't know uh, exactly how we'll, we'll we'll figure that out later. But there'll be a TV up there, and we will watch a movie, which will be disclosed later. And we will watch it, and then I will make principles out of that movie on Saturday night. And then on Sunday, uh, we'll go ahead and have our regular class. But Monday through Friday will be an... Uh, I guess, uh, accelerated series of the basic studies that we are studying. And um, I realize that uh, maybe some of you want to see this church grow. Well, that's fine. But do you know something? Maybe there's not positive volition out there. Maybe there is. But maybe there's not. And if there's not positive volition out there, well, we'll just have us right here learning the Word of God. And do you know what? If each one of us were to reach Pleroma to Theo, do you know how much impact that has? We could actually save our country from destruction. If each one of us, all of us, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then me, that's nine. There are nine people. And do you know that if nine people were to go to spiritual maturity and then to reach Pleroma to Theo, do you know what that means? That means that you have had an impact on your country. And the fact is, there's not very many who are positive. There never is. There never has been. During Now, Lewis Perry Schaefer wrote Systematic Theology. Now, Systematic Theology is a book that's about this big. I mean, if you were to put it all together, it's going to be about this big. And if you were to read through it, nobody does it. Nobody's going to read through all that. I'm trying to. But if you read through all of that, it's a book this big. And he complained in that book about the fact that nobody cared. 
Well, nobody does care. And that's the way it is through all of history. Most people don't care about the Word of God, and if they cared, they would be here today. Because as I was driving down 85, I saw church after church after church. And then here on 28 out here, I saw church after church after church. But they're not teaching the, the Word of God. They're, they're um, doing some type of social life or doing something else. And why are they doing that? Because that's how they get their uh, congregations together. And they're worried about numbers and they're worried about money. And you know here we're not worried about that. You know that. We're not worried about money. I am concerned with putting out the Word of God. Now, I might teach up here uh, today for quite a while just to let you know how important this is. It's the Word of God, and all of you need to know how important that is. And so I was up at uh, 3 o'clock this morning make, making a constitution. Maybe this church will grow. I don't know. Maybe it'll grow. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll collapse. But I want you to know that the most important thing in your life should always be the Word of God. And it's the Word of And you're not going to get this teaching in Anderson today. You're not going to get anything like this today. If you were to go to some church, they would uh, tell you to invite Christ into, their, into your heart, and they would give a 15-minute message. You're not going to get that from me, because I know the Word of God, and I know how important it is to your life. And that's what I'm going to teach. And I don't care if there's one person here. I'm going to teach it to that one person because where two or more are gathered together he will be there with them and if two or more let's say it's just uh, uh, me and my dad or me and Brad well uh, that is uh, two I'm teaching one now one on one teaching as per counseling is not accepted by the Bible but if I'm teaching to a congregation of one so what somebody's getting the word and it will have an impact it will have an impact on this country. Do you know if uh, one person goes to play Roma to that? Hey, do you know how much impact you have? Do you know how much power you have in your spiritual life? Do you know? You probably don't. But when you are filled with God the Holy Spirit and you grow up spiritually under the unique spiritual life, you have a power that is absolutely phenomenal. You don't understand how phenomenal how phenomenal it is. It is tremendous. The fact that you can change the course of history, and you can. Moses did, and you can. And the Apostle Paul did. The Apostle Paul changed the course of history. So I was reading this article on American exceptionalism written by Rush. Uh, Limbaugh, and I will continue uh, with this. For generations, those in chains, in other chains, that means in slavery, for generations, those in chains in other lands, those in gulags, now you, gulags, that was the, uh, that's what they had in communist Russia, those in gulags, those tortured and oppressed by tyrants, humanity's commonplace condition, until the rise of this great power have looked to the shining city upon a hill, America, as a sweet beacon of freedom, or, as the great Ronald Reagan put it, this, the last, best hope of mankind. Now, Ronald Reagan just died recently, but when he said this, the last, best hope of mankind. He didn't know what he was saying, but he's saying something that is very important because this is the last best hope of mankind. Because within a client nation, and we are a client nation, we have uh, missionaries that go out and give the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that's what they give when they go out to places like Africa or other places. Uh, where the gospel's not readily available. So we have, uh, in America, people who go out and give the gospel. 
and that makes us a client nation to God. So we are the last hope. And uh, why is that? Because we are a client nation. Uh, we send out hope all across the world. And what is the hope? To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we send out is missionaries to tell the people around the world to wake up and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are a client nation, and this is very important. And I'll continue with what this article says. This profound philosophical thread has not been lost to history. In his 2003 State of the Union address, President Bush declared, We Americans have faith in ourselves, but not in ourselves alone. We do not claim to know all the ways of providence. What's the ways of providence? The ways of God. We, don't, we do not claim to know all the ways of providence, yet we can trust in them. In other words, George Bush is saying, we can trust in the ways of the Lord. And we have a wonderful president right now. Now, he might not be that, uh, I'm not going to judge him in that, but we'll just say we have a wonderful president right now, and you should be thankful for it. Uh, it's the, uh, the best president we've had since Reagan, and um, that's a wonderful thing. So I will continue with what George uh, Bush said. America, as a sweet beacon of freedom, or as the great Ronald Reagan put it, this the last best hope of mankind. And from the beginning, Americans knew. As the nation was born in revolution, our founders, uh, the sense of the guiding hand of providence, permeated their writings and their prayers. From the start, this awareness of being blessed by the Creator engendered a tenacious spiritual confidence a faith that this nation conceived in liberty, and this is Lincoln's words. Uh, Lincoln said this nation uh, was conceived uh, by faith in liberty and uh, shall not perish from the earth. In other words, a nation conceived that loves the word of God shall not perish from the earth. And Abraham Lincoln understood this. And it's amazing that Abraham Lincoln understood this uh, because well, there were a lot of a lot more doctrinal teachers that uh, existed back in the time when this nation was founded. And therefore, when Lincoln said that, he was just saying that uh, in this nation we were conceived in liberty and we will not perish. In other words, as long as we hold fast to liberty, as long as we hold fast to the liberty of the Word of God, for in Christ we shall, made, we shall be made free. And how is that? Through faith alone, in Christ alone. And uh, Lincoln was recognizing both the spiritual matters and the human matters that concern our freedom. And Lincoln, uh, from all the writings that I've uh, studied, and I've studied some of Lincoln's writings, Lincoln, I do believe, was a mature believer. And um, he wrote and uh, spoke a lot of these things. And when he got up and spoke, he mentioned God a lot. Now, we have a great movement in this nation today to stamp out the Word of God. Now, I've been to Washington, D.C., and when I went to Washington, I looked in the monuments, and every monument mentioned the name of God. This nation is unique. I'm going to tell you right now this nation is unique because uh, we're the only nation in the world that recognizes the Lord in that way and we recognize the Lord and we do that uh, all the time and that's what the monuments did they recognized the Lord and in doing so it shows that at one time not now but at one time we were a nation in which there was a lot of people who loved the word of God and people in this nation today don't love it they want a uh, social life. What are you going to get out of a social life? Nothing. You need a spiritual life, a spiritual life to uh, uh, glorify God. And by doing so, we will have a country that succeeds. 
But if people in this country don't care about the Word of God, we will go under. Now, for those of us who have uh, uh, taken heed to these warnings, and for those of us who have learned the Word of God, we will be protected in all of this when the country goes under, and it will, unless there's a turnaround. And when that occurs, um, we will be protected by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ because of our positive volition. But if you've been negative the whole time, well, you're going to go under with all the rest of them, and it's going to be terrible. And I'm going to live to see, well, uh, well, if I live long enough, I'll live to see it. I might die when I'm, I might die tomorrow. We don't know when we're going to die. But if I were to live long enough, uh, for example, if I were to live the normal age of, uh, what is it now, is it up to 80? 72. 72? Okay. Well, we'll go with that. If I were to live to 72, and then uh, by that time this country would be gone unless there's a turnaround. There needs to be a turnaround in this country. There needs to be people who want to listen to the Word of God. There needs to be people who want to know exactly what the Word of God says. And there's no church today around here. Now, we drove all the way from Gaffney, and from Gaffney all the way down here to Anderson, there's not one church, not one, that teaches what I'm teaching here. They're not teaching anything. And people don't want, if they wanted it, they would be here today. They would show up and they would say, I want to hear the Word of God, but they don't. They don't want to hear the Word of God. But I'll be here, and then in April, we're going to have a conference. And in April, uh, that April, the first week of April, and you say, oh, no, he's going to he's gonna just teach. All. Well, you don't have to be here, but I'll be here. And then uh, probably from 6.30, I'm thinking 6.30 right now, it'll start. And at 6.30, it'll start, and I'll go till um, 7.30 or 8. And Monday through Friday... We're going to have two messages a day. And why are we going to do that? Because I'm going to be out of work. Now, I was supposed to go on vacation, but I, I decided, I said, no. There's, there are things more important than vacation. And so I said, no, I'm not going to go on vacation. My vacation is to be right here and to teach the Word of God. So I'll be here Monday through Friday, and you say, oh, no, I'll miss my uh, TV show. We'll find, no, you don't have to watch your TV show. If that's the way you think, watch your TV show. But if you want to be here and listen, I'll be here at 6.30, and it will go for two hours. And we'll have two hours a day, and you say, "How can you, I can do it. Believe me, I can do it. If I can do this while I'm working, I can do this. And uh, when I'm not working, I can go uh, for five days. And I won't be working that week, so therefore I'll have two messages, and it will be called a conference. And what happens at a conference? I've been to conferences. And what happens at a conference is uh, you, you have an intensified study of the Word of God. So we're going to have a conference, which means an intensified study of the Word of God. And we will be studying from 6.30 until whenever I decide to finish. And then uh, we'll do that every day, Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday we'll have some entertainment and you say oh is this church turning into some type of no it's going to happen one time as a special event and we're going to have Saturday night at the movies and I'm not going to tell you what movie we're going to watch but on Saturday night we'll bring in a TV I don't know and I've got a little too well, any type of TV that we can bring in we'll bring it in here and we'll watch it and we'll put a movie in a VHS or CD or a DVD whatever we can put in there, and we will watch a movie Saturday night. Now, some of you might not show up Monday through Friday and then show up for the entertainment Saturday. That's fine, if that's what you want to do. Because after the CD, I'm going to have a message after the DVD. And after that DVD, I will give you a message concerning the DVD because there will be a lot of application to be made from that DVD and I will make a lot of application of doctrine from that, and, and it'll be quite interesting. And you will learn a lot of doctrine during that week. And, in fact, we'll probably get finished with basic, basics during that week, and we can move on to Matthew. And if you're curious as to what we'll be doing, 
we're going to have Matthew uh, verse by verse after we do basics. We're going to have Matthew verse by verse. And then we're going to have Acts verse by verse. And then we're going to have Romans verse by verse. And In other words, we're going to go through the entire uh, New Testament scriptures verse by verse. When we get through it, now Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you say, why don't you go to Mark? Well, because uh, Matthew and Mark are just about the same, and they come at it from different angles. And uh, I'll tell you about all of that, but we're going to just uh, go from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to go straight to the Acts, and we're going to have Matthew, and then we're going to have Acts, and then we're going to have Romans, and we're going to go through every um, uh, book of the Bible in the New Testament, and, uh, and and that's how it's going to work. And then we will know these things of the Scripture. And the best thing for you to do is to know the Scripture. So, I will continue with this American exceptionalism. This profound philosophical thread has not been lost to history. In his 2003 State of the Union Address, President Bush declared... We Americans have faith in ourselves, but not in ourselves alone. We do not claim to know all the ways of providence, yet we can trust in them. Placing our confidence in a loving God behind all of life and all of history. In other words, George Bush is saying that he knows Jesus Christ controls history. And I know he knows this by this phrase that he said on 2003 at the State of the Union address. He actually knows that Jesus Christ controls history. And we are privileged as a nation to have such a president. And I can tell you that because we don't deserve it. We're going under. I mean, we are... We are in some dire straits, and unless people get with the Word of God, we will go under as a country. We will fall, and it's not going to be a pleasant sight. Not at all. What much of the world we will never understand, because they mistake this confidence for arrogance. In other words, Europe. Europe looks down their nose at us and they say, we are arrogant, but we are not. We are confident, and we are confident in freedom, and we are confident in the Lord. And that's what we're confident in, and that's what Europe hates, because they're degenerate. Europeans are degenerate, and that is a fact. And is that America's sense of herself and her purpose has always been infused with deep, Humble gratitude to God for the gift of liberty, a treasure without price. And the liberty you have right now to assemble yourselves together and to come here and to listen to Bible doctrine is a privilege. Do you know that in China they don't have this privilege? It is a privilege. Do you know that if you were to assemble yourselves together in China, they would look at you and throw you in jail? Do you know that? You need to get with the Word. You need to get with Bible doctrine because we live in a country that has freedom in which you can do this without threat of going to jail. And that's a wonderful thing, that we have this freedom. So we continue. That is why so many Americans, and this is why, because we have freedom. I'm sorry you're bored. I'm really sorry that you're bored. But this is important. Our country will go under unless you get with the Word of God. I hope you understand this. And, and if you want to reject it, that's, that's your privilege. But you will be part of the fact that this country goes down. You will be part of it unless you accept these things of the Word of God. So, we continue with what I was talking about and reading in this. Not in vain have our countrymen given the last full measure of devotion. What's the last full measure of devotion? They died for their country. And people have died 
so you can sit here today and listen to the Word of God without anyone uh, uh, bothering you about it. Now, in China, they would bother you. They would look from next door, and they would look at you, and they would say, you have, or they, they would look over and say, oh, look over there. Mr. So-and-so is having a uh, Bible class, let's call the authorities, and that's what they would do. But we live in a country of freedom, and people gossip here, but it hasn't gotten that bad, but I'm waiting for it to get that bad, because it seems that gossip is accepted among even believers, and that's a terrible thing. And I'm sorry if you're bored, and I say that again. You shouldn't be bored. This is important. The things of the Word of God are important. The fact that you live in freedom is important. Don't be bored by this. Try to listen to it. You will understand your purpose in life. It is not to just be a flake and to run around and to have approbation less. That means approval. And to have approval. I'm spitting all over the place. Well, that's okay. I'm fired up. So, we ha you have a the approval lust toward people all the time. That is not, you're not here on this earth to impress people. Have you thought about God? What about God? What about, it? and God has set up a system of grace by which we receive the approval of God, and the first thing we do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we receive approval from God, and we actually have um, a relationship with God simply by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that begins our spiritual life, and that's how it starts. In a 1974 speech, Reagan said, you can call it mysticism if you want to, but I have always believed that there was some divine plan that placed this great continent between two oceans and uh, to be sought out by those who were possessed of an abiding love of freedom and a special kind of courage. Now, if you didn't grow up under the Reagan era, I can tell you that it was a wonderful thing to grow up and to have Ronald Reagan as your president. And I don't know uh, where he was spiritually, but I do know that he understood freedom. And this is what he said, and he always spoke eloquently. Ronald Reagan was the most eloquent president we could ever have. And this is what he said. You can call it mysticism if you want to, but I have always believed that there was some divine plan that placed this great continent between two oceans to be sought out by those who were possessed of an abiding love of freedom and a special kind of courage. And he was talking about us, these people of the United States of America. This is the entire foundation of what is called the American can-do spirit. This is why the phrase American optimism overcomes obstacles. This is, um, and then we will continue. It all begins with freedom, because we are free to forge ahead as we see fit. We can and do forge ahead, and nothing can stop us. In 1981, President Reagan closed his inaugural address with this clincher. The crisis we are facing today does require our best effort. And in 1980, if you remember those times, those were rough times. And um, I don't remember those times. I was, when, in 1981, I was three or four. And I don't remember what was going on, but through history I know what was going on. And those were terrible times. People need to remember back to those times, by the way, so they know who to vote for wisely. In 1981, President Reagan closed his inaugural address with this clincher. The crisis we are facing today does require our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are 
Americans. And that's what Ronald Reagan said. And uh, then uh, Rush Limbaugh talks about some politics here, and we're not here to talk about politics, so I'll continue with the principles behind it. Not for nothing does our national anthem define the, this nation as the land of the free and the home of the brave. Always remember, it is the freedom that unleashes the bravery. In other words, our love for freedom unleashes our bravery to fight for that freedom. There are young men, people younger than me, I often think about this at times, there are 18. In fact, uh, there's a, a guy, well, the, the lady at work has a son who's 18. Actually, he started when he was 17. He went into the Army with a, a special exception as a 17-year-old, and she signed off that he could go into the and That's what he wanted to do. After September 11th, he said, I want to defend my country. He was 17 years old, and, um, and uh, his mother... And by the way, his mother started out as a Jehovah's Witness, and they don't believe in war or any. Well, they they just wouldn't. But uh, her 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 son kind of changed her around because her son said, "Look, I'm here to fight for freedom. I'm going to fight for the freedom of these United States of America." And he says, "I'm going to do it, and I don't care what your religious beliefs are." And he told her, he said, "I know what you believe. I know what you think about war and all of this, but I don't care." I know that I need to fight for my country. And that's what he did at the age of 17. That shocks me. At the age of 17, he said, I'm going into the army and I'm going to fight for my country. And that's exactly what he did. And he ended up having to go to Baghdad. And he was shot at. And there were bombs that blew off, you know, the car bombs. He was involved in all of that. He's told me about it. When he's come back, he's talked to me about all the things that he's faced over there. And it is dangerous over there. Now, it's not as dangerous as it was in Vietnam, where hundreds of people died a day, but it's still dangerous. And he was right on the front lines in the 82nd Airborne. And if you keep up with the news, you know that the 82nd Airborne is right there on the front lines. So he saw his buddies, his young buddies, 18 to 20 years old, get blown up right there in Iraq. And they're doing this for our freedom, and he understands that. And he knows he's doing that for our freedom. And I shook his hand, and I looked at him, and I said, Thank you. Thank you for doing this for our country. And um, he was, uh, and believe me, people who are over fighting and those situations out in the hot, they need to hear something like that. They, re they remember it when they're out in the field. And when they're out in the field fighting, they remember uh, those people who have said thank you. And they remember those people who have said thank you for fighting out in the field. Now, in Vietnam, when people came back, they were spit on. And that's disgusting. And maybe our country might turn around. Because today, when they come back, if, uh, for example, they came back uh, to Houston one time off the airplane, and everybody stood up and started clapping for those military men who were coming back from Iraq. So maybe our country's turning around, maybe not. It doesn't seem anybody cares for doctrine, and that's how, when you care for the Word of God, that's how you turn a country around, like Moses did. Moses, one person, and there were two million people under Moses, and one person changed the history of Israel. So I'm going to read the last thing that he says here concerning uh, what our country has been doing on in this war on terror. And like I said, I'm going to give you a reason to have a break today. I'm going to keep going and going, and then we'll have a break when I feel like it. Okay, so we will continue. Victor Davis Hanson points out on National Review Online that in less than four months we have seen elections take place in Afghanistan, the Ukraine, among the Palestinians, and in Iraq. In the span of 113 days, more than 100 hundred million people living on two different continents 
have voted and they've never known freedom until this day. And this is courtesy of the United States military. And we don't deserve to be this powerful, but we are. We are this powerful because there are a few people who are concerned with the Word of God. And if you're concerned with the Word of God, if you're concerned with growing in grace and growing in knowledge, and if you're concerned with this thing, these things, you will grow in grace and you will have an application. In other words, you will have a testimony to this country. And you need to have a testimony to this country. And we need a younger generation to grow up and have a testimony to this country because without it, we will go under. We will. That's just the way it's going to be because God honors those who listen to his word. And one day we'll study that in Hosea. And Hosea, now Hosea had a right woman. Hosea's right woman was a slut. I'll put it to you lightly. She was a slut. And that's lightly. She was much more than that. She was even worse. And she went around and she had sex with everyone else uh, besides her husband. And the first uh, baby she had, Hosea said, you know what Hosea named that first baby? Not mine. He said, not mine. And that was what he named the baby. And that's interesting. And then... She continued on this rampage. Well, this, uh, well, Hosea was a prophet. And he had a special purpose that uh, God had given to him. And God told him, he said, Do you know what, Hosea? Your wife is playing a harlot. And you live in Israel. And he said, Hosea, Israel is playing a harlot. And today, America is playing the harlot. And that's the problem. And that's why we need to get with the Word of God. So Hosea, uh, his wife, was playing the harlot, and through grace he accepted her. Finally, she changed her mind, and she went and she went with him. And he said, "Okay, I forget." And he really did forgive her. It was never brought up again. He forgave her. When you forgive somebody, you don't bring up. You don't bring it up. When you get mad, you don't bring up their faults again. It's over. You forgave it. And that's what he did. He forgave what she had done. And she went back with him. And that was a sign that Israel had got back with doctrine. And this is what the United States needs to do. We need to get back with doctrine. And if we do, we're forgiven. And nothing else is said about it. We'll just be forgiven. And we'll continue in prosperity and in freedom. And that's a wonderful thing. So where was I? Victor Davis Hanson points out on National View Online that in less than four months, we have seen elections take place in Afghanistan, the Ukraine, among the Palestinians, and in Iraq. In the span of 113 days, more than 100 million people, and that's phenomenal, living on two continents, have cast free votes in nations that have never known freedom. And then he ends this article by saying, God bless America. It is the uh, American military that gave freedom to 100 million more people. And it's a wonderful thing. Now, I didn't know if all of this would work out. I didn't know that uh, if uh, America invaded Iraq and uh, tried to make them free, I thought, well, well, these Arab people, they'll never understand freedom. But they, uh, they seem to be catching on to freedom. And um, it's a wonderful, and that's the grace of God, by the way. And um, I thought they would be shooting us at us all the time, but they have finally come around and said, we want to be free. And they actually fight for their own freedom. On election day, when they went out on election day, they were in danger of getting shot and killed, and yet they had more people, a more percentage, turned out to vote than turn out in this country to vote. Isn't that phenomenal? We are, we are supposed to be the nation of what is called democracy, which is not. It's a republic. We are a republic in which people go out and vote. And more people, percentage-wise, went out and voted in the Iraqi election for the first time. That's phenomenal. Now, you won't get that on TV. You won't hear that on TV because television, they hate George Bush on television. Uh, Dan Rather, all those people. 
Uh, I didn't mean to name a name, but Dan Rather, I'll name the name. He hates George W. Bush, and he and um, that's why these things have occurred. And I'm sorry that you're bored, but you're going to get a lot more bored because I got a long way to go. So tonight we're going to start with sin. I'm just getting started with the message. How about that? Tonight we're gonna, uh, or t- this morning we're gonna deal with sin. It's, uh, night and morning doesn't mean anything to me anymore. So we're gonna begin <laughs> with sin. So the last time that I showed you this on the board, uh, we had an area of strength and an area of weakness. And let me put this on the board for you again, because it's important. You need to know these things of the Word of God, and they are part of the Word of God. And you say, you make these diagrams. I don't see that in the Bible. I'm teaching you the Bible, and I'm putting that on top of one that's already there. Well, once I fill it out, I'll use this one. Okay, so in this, we have in our sin nature, and I'll uh, draw that oval egg. This time I'll make it a little bigger. And then this down the middle. And we have the... uh, area of weakness on one side and that is where all of our temptation comes from when we have our area of, is there a question That's okay. standard operate did I not do the standard operating procedure I've been I've not been doing that for a while but if you don't uh, know the standard operating well, let's go over here and I'll show you the area of strength. I can't believe I didn't do the oper- the standard operating procedure. I must have got so excited about what I had to teach. <laughs> I forgot how you pronounce it, but didn't you define both of these in one word on each side uh, of the other night? Yeah, I'll get to that. With, one, with just one word, you define both areas of strength. That's and true. In a different term, and not that's true. I remember how to pronounce it. Yeah, but it was antinomianism. That's true. It was antinomianism on this side, and it was legalism on this side. And after I teach the area of weakness and area of strength, I'll get to that. So you'll see that in just a moment. Just be patient with me. And uh, if you haven't rebounded, and if you're in a state of sin, maybe you should rebound. And you can do that in your own mind. You can say, Father, I've committed whatever sin you've committed. And then you'll be in fellowship. And that might be why you haven't been concentrating so much. So if you're in fellowship, you can concentrate. So, well, let me go ahead and do it, since it's such an issue, and it is an issue. It's very important to understand uh, 1 John 1, nine, And 1 John 1, nine states, If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And if you do not utilize 1 John 1, nine, that means that you are out of fellowship and you do not understand the Word. You will never. If you are in a state of sin, you will never understand the Word of God. If you are under a state of sin, you will never come to understand Numa Tikas. And Numa Tikas is spiritual phenomenon. And if you don't understand spiritual phenomenon, you will never grow up spiritually. So therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as I do need to utilize the standard operating procedure, and I feel ashamed for not doing so. I really do. And uh, I should have done it. It's actually in my notes right here, but I didn't do it. That's because I stayed up till 3. I need to stop doing that. I need to get up. I need to get some sleep so I know what I'm doing when I get up here. Because obviously... Uh, apparently I don't know what I'm doing so let's pray Uh, well first of all uh, we utilize the standard operating procedure of 1 John 1 9 if we name our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing and if we do so if we name our sins we are put into fellowship and we are said to be uh, uh, spiritual and spiritual is an absolute so uh, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer giving each of you the opportunity to be in fellowship uh, so that you might learn uh, uh, Bible doctrine. So uh, let us pray.
Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to study your word. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So, we have another hour to go, don't we? All right. So, let's study these. Uh, I have these notes. Do you know? I'm just now getting with my notes. That means we can go on for a long time, and I think we should. So, we will. Last time I showed you on this board, and I drew that circle, the area of weakness and the area of strength. And as the fellow said, there's more to come, which has to do with uh, the legalism over here and then antinomianism. But we haven't got to that yet. We're all right now we're just studying an area of weakness and an area of strength. So uh, be patient with it. I'll get to all of it. And I know you're anxious to learn these things, and I'm happy you are. But we'll get to it. So just uh, just relax, and we'll get to all of it as uh, we move through this study. So I showed you an area of strength and an area of weakness. And from the area of strength, of course, comes human good. Now Isaiah 64, 6 says, uh, All righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And, of course, we noted the corrected translation of that and uh, the corrected translation seems to offend people but I'm sorry about that it's just the truth and uh, that's because we live in an area where a pastor has to uh, follow a certain um, well if a pastor uh, says a certain word he can't be a pastor that's not true and then over here we have an area of weakness and in the area of weakness, that is the source of all temptation. And we are tempted from the area of weakness. And whatever that may be, we might be under legalism. And what's legalism? Legalism is when uh, you want to judge other people. And we're going to get into that today. Uh, when people judge you and malign you and gossip about you. And that might be their area of weakness. And then over here in the area of strength, you might say, I would never gossip, malign, and judge somebody. And that's your area of strength. So we have an area of strength and an area of weakness. And then uh, we will get to the other. Actually, there's going to be three things here. Uh, we'll start uh, today with uh, this up here. And then there'll be one down here. And then there'll be another uh, very shortly. So we'll get to it. Don't get anxious and get ahead of yourself. We'll get to all of this. And it's a wonderful thing. So, um, last time I showed you on the board and I drew that circle of the area of strength and the area of weakness. And from the area of strength comes human good and evil. And then from the area of weakness comes the sin that we commit. So, point one, if you want to write down point one. Point one, the old sin nature has an area of strength and it has an area of weakness. The area of strength produces human good. So you can write that now. That is, all of your production outside of fellowship is called wood, hay, and stubble. And we looked at that earlier in 1 Corinthians. Everything that you uh, do outside of fellowship is called wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, point two, there are trends to the old sin nature. And I believe this is what uh, the fellow was talking about when he said, uh, last time you showed me something on the board. And I did. And I'm going to show it to you on the board again. And this one's in color. Feel privileged. All right. So we have over here in uh, legalism on one side. and then antinomianism on the other side. Now legalism, what is that? Oh, well these people, they like to uh, gossip, malign, and judge fellow believers. Let's try to make this look better. Let's move that up. There we go. Legalism over here. These people like to gossip, malign, and judge. And then over here, the antinomian person, they like to raise hell. They go out and go to a bar, get drunk, 
have a one night stand, commit fornication, commit adultery, uh, whatever. They have fun over here. And then over here, they gossip about these people. And that is the polari polarization uh, among believers that occurs uh, as a result of that. So that is the trends of the old sin nature. Legalism versus antinomianism. Now you have a lust pattern in the old sin nature. Now we all have a uh, an old sin nature, and in that old sin nature we have a lust pattern. And in the lust pattern, uh, whatever you operate under, uh, you can't live the spiritual life under a lust pattern. And therefore there is the importance of naming your sins and disregarding those things that are behind and moving on in your spiritual life. And lust, we're going to be studying lust right now. And lust include, and if you want to write them down, that would be nice. You have, uh, you can have power lust. And a lot of politicians suffer from this. Lust include power lust. And you can have approbation lust. Now what is approbation lust? That means you're always concerned with what other people think of you. You conform to other people because of what they think of you. And approbation lust is a lust, and it will take you out of the spiritual life. And um, a lot of people don't know this, and it's not taught in churches around here or anywhere, uh, except uh, just a few around the country it might be taught. But in approbation lust, when you, have, when you want to get approval from other people, that is a sin. It is a sin, and it is a lust. And if you lust that way your whole life, you will never be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And why is that? Because if you are uh, lusting to get approval from somebody, and uh, do you under the problem with people who do that is uh, they don't understand the, the, the depravity of man. I'm depraved. I make an announcement today that I am depraved. All of us here today are depraved, and that is because all of us here today have within our members an old sin nature. And we will all do something that is wrong at some point. We will all sin, and we will all do something, and a lot of times we will hurt people. We might not even know we're hurting people, but we will hurt people. And what happens in approbation lust, the person who has approval lust will say, well, that person hurt me. I am ashamed. I'll never see that person again because they have hurt me. And that's a part of uh, approval lust, which is called approbation lust. And you shouldn't go through that. Uh, we need to adjust to God. And the more we adjust to God instead of to people, the more we will have a wonderful life. The more we adjust to God, well, we won't care. Well, people will do us wrong, and we'll just say, "Well, uh, except for the grace of God, there go I," and uh, just uh, let it be. Uh, cast all your cares upon the Lord, as per First Peter, and and that's just the way it is. And so, so what? Somebody meant, uh, did you wrong. So what? You need to live your own spiritual life. So when you get focused on people, and you have an uh, people emphasis over. A God emphasis that will destroy your spiritual life. So we had approbation lust, and now we move on to inordinate ambition, which results in inordinate competition. And inordinate means excessive. And we studied that in Acts. Remember in Acts where Ananias and Sapphira were trying to get ahead in the church by uh, saying they gave all the money to Paul when they had held back some and they lied to God the Holy Spirit and dropped dead and that's what happened to them and we've studied that and if you don't uh, know about this we have it on tape do we have some tapes still left over there we do and that's good so if you want to get one through what does that say over there it's basic, basic MP3 MP3 well it's mp3 and uh, you can't play it on a CD player because it needs to be MP3. And uh, it's 1 through 12, and you can listen to that on tape if you haven't heard this because I talk about these things in the basics. 
And in fact, Basics 1 uh, tells you about how to be saved, and it's very important for you. And if just one person gets on that and they uh, learn about the Word of God, I'm pleased. So, uh, let's take a look at uh, lust again. So, we have the sexual lust. And I told you about the, uh, the approbation lust, which is approval lust. We can have sexual lust, and every one of us as believers can have a sexual lust. And also we have chemical lust. And what is chemical lust? Chemical lust is uh, you lust for drugs and you need to take drugs. You need to have a puff of marijuana or you need to uh, snort some cocaine or smoke some crack. or, or That's a chemical lust. Or you need to get drunk. You have to have that alcohol and get drunk. Well, that's a chemical lust. And then you have monetary lust. And that's what uh, Judas Iscariot suffered under as an unbeliever. He suffered under monetary lust, and he actually betrayed our Lord for money. And a monetary lust is a problem also among believers, but I am not going to get in detail about that, but I will in the future at some point when it is pertinent. And we have crusader lust, and that's the idea that you can change the entire world, that you can go out and whitewash the devil's world. You think you can go out and change people's old sin natures? You're wrong. You can't. And this is part of arrogance. This is, by the way, the devil's world. The devil is actually in control. Of, now, Jesus Christ controls history, but uh, he is the leader of the world. And that's why, and we'll get into the cosmic system, and we will study the cosmic system. And all of these things, will be pertinent to our spiritual life. And uh, we have a lust for revenge and then uh, chemical lust. And pleasure lust. Now, there's nothing wrong with pleasure. For example, Saturday night, that first week in April when I have the conference, maybe nobody will show up, but that's fine. I'm still going to teach and put it on tape. Maybe people in other parts of the country will pick up on it. But I'm going to have... Uh, the, the tapes available, and there's going to be two messages a night, Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday, it's going to be Saturday night at the movies, and I'm going to, now if you just show up for the movie, well, that's your prerogative, but uh, I'll know what's in your soul. So uh, Saturday night at the movies, we'll have this up here, uh, TV, and we'll watch it, and then I'll make application out of it, and uh, it'll be a nice time, and that doesn't mean we're turning to entertainment. We're not. It's just a one-time special event because I will be out of work. So it'll be a one-time special event on Saturday in which we'll have a TV up here and we will watch the movie and then I'll make application from it because this movie, I'm not telling you what it is yet because it's a surprise, but this movie has a lot of application to come out of it. So if you're around the first week of April, I'm not going, as you see, I was supposed to go on vacation that week. And then I said, well, I have a church. I have people's souls to tend to. I have a flock to tend to. I cannot go and, uh, and leave them there during the week. So what I'm going to do instead of going on vacation is I'm actually going to increase it. There will be two messages per night, Monday through Friday. And you say, how can you do that? Oh, I can. Believe me, just watch. Monday through Friday, I'll do that. And then on Saturday, we'll have... Uh, Saturday night at the movies and on Sunday and then we'll resume our regu regular schedule of Tuesday and Thursday and I've decided it's going to stay Tuesday, Thursday at 7 and then uh, Sunday as we're doing today because uh, if I were to do any more I think I would collapse. Okay, so let's take a look at the lust pattern. Now we're going to uh, study the function of the lust pattern and how it destroys your spiritual life. Now, um, well, let's have, it's been an hour and ten minutes, and uh, we'll have a break. And if you need to go, you can go, and then uh, the next part might be more than an hour, too. So if you want to go home and uh, do something else, you might want to do so, because the next hour, it's going to be longer than an hour, and you say, oh, no, 
that's horrible. I want to go to bed. Well, go to bed. Just leave. <laughs> I don't. If that's the way you think about it, go ahead. But th- this is the Word of God, and it's important. And that's why I'm teaching more, and that's why I've been extending the hours, because it is the Word of God. And the Word of God is very important in our lives. And without the Word of God, we'll never know happiness. We will die the sin face to face with death as believers if we do not get with the Word of God. And we'll be studying that under the basic series. In fact, uh, last night, while I was up so late, I was making out a listing of the basic series and exactly what I needed to be teaching. And after we get through the uh, sins of the tongue, which I should have been through already, I guess this message, the, these messages on the sins of the tongue are going to go on for a while. And that's fine. Now, I'll get to them in the next message. So, uh, with your heads bowed and with your eyes closed. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to study your word. Uh, and if you're here uh, this morning without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, uh, you need to understand that there is hope for you, and it is listed uh, throughout the Scripture. In John 3.15, it says that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. By simple faith alone in Christ alone, you can have eternal life. And in John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his uh, uniquely born Son in order that anyone who believes in him shall never perish, and that's talking about eternal security, but have eternal life. And then in John 3.18, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. And notice that believe is repeated three times because the only way of salvation is to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in John 3.36, it reiterates that point. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And so the issue of salvation is whether or not you believe in Christ. And then in John 6, 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who believes in me has eternal life. John 11, 25, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. John 11, 26, And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And that means you have to believe in Christ before you die so that you might have uh, eternal life. So I've given you enough verses on that. And inaudibly, in thought only, you can tell God the Father. You can say, Father, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the moment of your salvation. And if you simply believe in Christ, you are saved. So we thank you, Father, for the opportunity this morning to study your word. And may God the Holy Holy Spirit give us concentration when it comes to the next hour and a half of a message so that we might uh, grow in grace and in knowledge, which is the only purpose by which we are alive and breathing on this earth. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.